is up, casuals? It is Monday, June the 3rd. If you are new here, I am the Notorious Nerdy D, the voice of the casual wrestling fans, and this is the Casual Wrestling Daily Show. We have a great week of content planned. Uh, Smackdown Cliff Notes today. We'll talk about Monday Night Raw tomorrow, but... Uh, it's really excited for what's dropping on Thursday this week. Just want to give you guys kind of a little hint of what's coming this week. I got the opportunity to sit down and shoot the shit with retired pro wrestler and all out cool ass dude sledge this past weekend. Uh, we talked for like two hours, just talking about AEW, talking about WWE, kind of some behind the scenes stories, lots of lots of cool stuff that that will come out on Thursday for the channel. One of the coolest things I've gotten to do since I started this podcasting journey. So that's being edited up as we speak uh, without any hitches in the plan that will drop Thursday, so look out for that episode. Uh, let's do what we always do here, and let's start out with the news. So Swerve Strickland came out and said, there's never been a better time for WWE and AEW to do a crossover event and break the forbidden door. <clears throat> God bless Stur uh, Swerve Strickland's heart, man. His mind is in the right place. He's one of us. I think he just wants good wrestling. But here is the problem, Swerve Strickland. It feels to me like you are the child of a messy divorce and you just, you just don't quite know what's going on. You're the delusional kid who thinks mommy and daddy can get along. And they can't. They can't swerve. This, this is the reality. This is the problem. Tony Khan continues to take shots at the throne. Tony Khan continues to do interviews where he speaks up and he talks about AEW being competition with WWE. Tony Khan continues to go onto news networks and talk about Vince McMahon, even though I understand WWE has distanced, them, distanced themselves from Vince McMahon he is still in the lore of the company. He is still the father-in-law of the guy who is controlling creative. And Tony Khan continues to double down and take shots and try to take food out of the mouth of the people from WWE. And the problem is, Swerve, that every chance people in your company get, MJF, Soraya, Edge, any chance they get, they love to talk about WWE. And that doesn't breed a healthy back and forth. Now, this is on top of the fact that there is no financial reason. There is no financial reason for WWE to ever partner with AEW. At the end of the day, wrestling is a business. And WWE is in the business of making money. And there is no financial incentives there's no marketing incentives aew doesn't bring in a new audience for wwe so there's no business reason to make this happen but on top of all of that swerve everybody in your company continues to take shots at the throne that doesn't create a healthy work environment that doesn't create a healthy back and forth and so while you may believe because your relationship is good with triple h probably and your relationship is fine with tony khan you see it as why can't everybody get along but the reality is when you look at this from both sides nobody in wwe is talking about aew nobody anymore like at most you're getting like a slip of the tongue on NXT where someone almost men uh, mentioned AEW, but it's, it's never in a negative light anymore. WWE doesn't see AEW as a competitor. That's just reality. And I know the IWC hates to hear that, but the truth is WWE doesn't see AEW as a competitor. Just like WWE doesn't see TNA as a threat. The difference is, is that WWE knows that TNA knows its place. TNA now knows where it sits in the wrestling hierarchy. We're third down the chart, whatever it is, we know where we sit and we can benefit each other because we are willing to cross over in the places it makes sense. There's no AEW star that's going to want to cross over and come to NXT. I can guarantee you right now that all of these egomaniacal maniacs in AEW will, will see 
taking a a role in NXT as a as a step down. Whereas you have people like Jordan Grace who understand lateral movement with the ability to move up if I ever do go to WWE. That's that is the difference here. And I don't think Swerve is able to wrap his head around and I'm sure he does. When what I'm speaking is just based off what he said here, but I don't think Swerve fully comprehends the reality of the bigger situation because he's one of the good ones. He's one of the ones that's not taking the shots. He's one of the ones that has the good relationship on both sides. Swerve is a guy that I think if he picked up the phone and called Triple H right now, Triple H, hands down, he, write in the check, whatever you need, come back, we'll make things right. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's the case for a lot of other guys, including MJF. I think MJF might have made that call, and Triple H was like, look, man, here's what I can give you. I can offer you WrestleMania, and that's it. Whereas I think they would bend over backwards to get Swerve back into the WWE. <clears throat> um, oh, we found out the real reason why Soraya's match was pulled off of AEW, uh, AEW Dynamite last week. So apparently, uh, it was never supposed to happen. Somehow, and this this baffles me, guys. This amazes me. So if you don't know what's going on, Soraya was supposedly supposed to have a match on Dynamite this week. It was released on Control Center. It got out. Come Dynamite. No Soraya match. We get a Mercedes Monet match. Then Soraya proceeds to go to social media and basically what feels like made a threat towards AEW to release the truth or whatever she was really feeling. And that's kind of where we're at right now. But this this story that I read here, this one saying that the match was never supposed to happen, this feels like damage control. This feels like Tony Khan trying to get ahead of something and and quiet the rumblings. Because right now, the last thing that Tony Khan needs is the people who jumped from WWE over to AEW and rode hard for him and came out and did take those shots at WWE. The last thing that Tony Khan needs is those people now flipping opinion and starting to kind of reveal the truth of what's really going on. The last thing Tony Khan needs right now is for Soraya to go, oh, let me talk to everybody. Let me explain what really goes on in the back here because I think it's messy. I think the back of AEW is extremely messy. I think that a lot of people picture this this organized, well-tuned machine. And I don't know who a lot of people are. I think the IWC does. The IWC pictures this well-tuned machine with producers. When really, I think it's just Tony Khan with a stack of papers running around screaming, you go here, you go here, you're going to do this tonight. You know, we've, we've heard the rumors now of him calling people last minute, of him rewriting shows right up until the last minute. It feels like at this point, it's not fun anymore for Tony Khan. It's becoming a shit show. You're starting to piss off people that you had made promises to. One problem I think for Tony Khan is I think he's a promise guy. I think he sits down with these free agents like Mercedes Monet, like Will Ospreay, like Soraya, and he promises the world, you can be the guy. You can have anything you want here. The, the world is a blank canvas. AEW is where you come up with the creative. You tell the stories. And that sounds great. And to somebody who maybe has come from WWE where it's so structured and you feel like you have no control, when you hear that, you go, oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here. And then the problem is with all sports, with all locker rooms, everybody can't be the guy. And so you get six weeks, 12 weeks, six months into these contracts and nothing has gone the way Tony Khan has told you and you start to get a little bit disgruntled and you start to get a little upset and then you get promised matches, right? You get promised matches on Dynamite because you won't be on TV and all of a sudden that new shiny toy, Mercedes Monet, that that Tony Khan bought, oh, we're going to put that where we said you were going to be. This all feels like damage control to me. This feels like Tony Khan. Here's the problem, right? So I saw another article where Tony Khan talked about that he was overwhelmed during the WWE draft weekend because it was a struggle to manage the Jacksonville Jaguars and AEW television at the same time. Here's my problem, Tony Khan. None of us believe that you have any real input into what the Jacksonville Jaguars are doing. So you can pretend they can give you a clipboard. They can let you make a couple phone calls, but none of us believe that you're making decisions that affect the day to day of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Here's what I believe. I believe that you walk into that draft room with a neck brace on and all of the real football people go, the fuck is this kid doing? 
Like, what is he doing? What are we doing this? And 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 I think that there's probably a lot of people within the Jacksonville organization that goes, oh, this is why we suck. This is why we can't fucking win. Because we're running a wrestling program at the same time as running an NFL football team and, and Daddy Khan's just letting it all mold together and just letting his son do whatever he wants. This this feels like 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 every reality show you've ever watched about a rich kid. Like what were those shows where the kids used to get like Corvettes for their 16th birthday? That's what Tony Khan feels like to me. And I know everybody goes, oh, he's made his own money. I don't know. I don't believe that shit. I think his dad went out, and made a bunch of money. He's got unlimited funds. He's got a cheat code. And so he can do whatever he wants. But when that all comes full circle and you're having to run a company and you're having to run the day to day, it's shit like this. That starts to pop up. It's shit like Soraya getting uncomfortable and, and not being happy anymore. That starts to put kinks in in the armor of what you thought was going to be just, you know, a perfect thing. I'm gonna book dream matches, and I'm gonna book all the matches that the, the internet has ever said they wanted. And and it just doesn't work out that way. Here here's my problem, right? My biggest problem is I'm gonna say this. Soraya has the most potential to bring in a casual wrestling audience for AEW outside of anyone named Britt Baker. I'll say it again. Soraya is the most casual wrestling friendly wrestler you have on your entire roster. She was the top woman in WWE for a long time. Outside of Britt Baker, who I think has every intangible you need to get over with a casual audience, Soraya is that girl more than Mercedes Monet. Mercedes Monet is coming off extremely unlikable to most casual wrestling fans right now. We're, we're starting to see and hear the rumblings of like, oh, she was messy backstage at WWE. Don't know if that's real or not, but that's a narrative that's being sent out and casual fans tend to latch on to that kind of news. And we're seeing Mercedes Monet not wrestle, come out and talk. Not, you know, I saw Mercedes Monet finish her. She's just, she's not the package that Sasha Banks was. She's great. I got no problem with Mercedes Monet, but I don't think she's going to attract this huge mass of casual wrestling fans over when you need more viewers. Soraya can do that. Soraya 100%. We'll refer to her as Paige. Not trying to be disrespectful, but let's re let's refer to her as the name when she was the top of the WWE women's division. There was a time she was running shit in WWE. Then you have injuries, you have unfortunate situations, things happen, life gets in the way, but that, that person is still there. That's who you have. And if Tony Khan can't figure out how to use that and make that work, that that's on him. That's on him. Uh, we have a possible timeline for Roman Reigns highly anticipated re, uh, return. So I'm seeing SummerSlam. The, the rumors are that, 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 uh, Roman will be back around SummerSlam. More importantly, <clears throat> you know, with Roman gone, I saw a different article that had a list and I wish I could find the graphic. Can't find the graphic. I looked it up, but I saw a graphic the other day with the current list of WWE superstars who are injured or on hiatus. And oh my God, when I look at this list, I have it, I have it written down right here. Asuka, CM Punk, Dominic Mysterio, Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch, Bobby Lashley, Big E, Charlotte Flair, Jimmy Uso, Rhea Ripley, Shotzi, Roman Reigns. That's a roster to itself. That is a roster to itself. This is who right now, and we're talking right now, we're talking like the WWE is just cooking, like the WWE is doing no wrong. Like the wrestling world is paying attention to WWE. The outside casual world is paying attention to WWE, and we're down Asuka, CM Punk, Dominic's still showing up, but he's not wrestling. Seth Rollins isn't there right now. Becky Lynch isn't there right now. Bobby Lashley is not on TV right now. Big E, we don't know what's going on with Big E. Charlotte Flair, Jimmy Uso, Rhea Ripley, possibly the biggest person in your company, Shotzi, and Roman Reigns, possibly the other biggest person in your company. And WWE's still cooking. They're still cooking. There's seven legitimate names on that list. Seven names that I will make an argument for that if they went to AEW, they'd immediately be the number one guy on the roster. Top guy, no questions asked. Let's look at it. CM Punk, we saw. 
merchandise. He was the top guy. They didn't want to let him break that ceiling. They didn't want to let him break through the ceiling, but he was the guy. CM Punk was the guy. Seth Rollins, immediately your number one if he goes to AEW. Becky Lynch, immediately your biggest star if she goes to AEW. Bobby Lashley, I can make the argument. I can make the argument that Bobby Lashley would be one of your top stars. Uh, Charlotte Flair, immediately your biggest top star. Rhea Ripley, immediately your biggest top star. And Roman Reigns, immediately your biggest top star. And these are people that are on the shelf right now for WWE. So as these names start to trickle back in over the next 365 days with this new booking of Triple H, whoo, whoo, IWC better watch out. You better watch out. SummerSlam's going to be massive this year. Like we've gone through, we've gone through some of the shit. We've gone through, and nothing wrong with what we've seen up to this point. It's been, it's been absolutely great. But now we're going to be cooking. Going into SummerSlam, we're going to be cooking. Let's, I mean, what? We're going to have some form of a bloodline civil war, right? If Roman comes back, he's fighting solo. He's fighting. Something's going down with the bloodline, and that's going to be big, right? We're going to have Logan Paul versus LA Knight. Love it. Love it. We've been waiting for this. Maybe long overdue, but I'm still here for it. Theory versus Waller looks like it's in play. Bailey versus Nia Jax, which is probably the thing I'm least interested in in WWE right now, but still not bad. It's still not bad. It's still fun to watch. Damian Priest versus Gunther is going to be fire. Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk is going to be fire. Liv versus Rhea, they are Triple H is cooking with this story. He's got all the right kind of story beats with Liv Morgan going. I don't love Liv Morgan, but if Triple H can book her into favorable situations, we're all going to pay attention. We could have Jey Uso versus the Wyatt Six or just the Wyatt Six in general. I don't know. We're going to have some version of that, I imagine, by SummerSlam. Then it's looking like we could get Cody Rhodes versus Randy Orton. Like SummerSlam's going to be rocking. It is going to be a big deal. And, and and so, yeah, with or without Roman coming back, I think we should be excited. All right, so let's get to the topic of the day here, which is going to be, from now on on Mondays, a... Smackdown Cliff Notes, Smackdown Spark Notes, Smackdown Abbreviated Edition. I'm going to let you guys know, if you missed Friday Night Smackdown, I will catch you guys up on what you missed. Starting with this week, we started with Nia Jax in the ring for a Queen of the Ring ceremony, which led to Bailey coming out to call her out, which then led to Chelsea Green and Piper Nevin attacking Bailey and essentially confirming a title shot for Piper in Scotland. No brainer. This is like I said earlier, this is I'm least excited about this. Look, Chelsea Green's on the screen, I'm excited. That gets me that that moves the needle for me a little bit. Why she's not more involved in major storylines kills me. I think she's entertaining. I think she is our truth to the second level. She has the ability to actually work in the ring extremely well, but also is just an entertainer. Sooner or later, Chelsea Green versus Bailey needs to be the story. Like Chelsea Green is someone who could bring the best out of Bailey. I get it. Nia Jax is, you know, is this big physical specimen and and her and Bailey probably going to be a pretty good match. I'm just not that excited about it. Uh, we knew we were going to Scotland. We knew we were going to probably get Piper Nevin. No brainer there. But like I said, this is just this is just standard shit for me. Uh, DIY took on the theory effect and um, pretty good, pretty solid match. Or it was uh, it was Champa versus Theory. It wasn't DIY versus Theory effect, but it was it's the story coming together. <sighs> you know. We we beg and we beg and we beg for them to split up the tag team titles. And then immediately, the thing that comes to my mind is, have we pulled everybody too thin? Have we pulled everybody too thin? Because the tag team divisions, once again, they feel a little soft to me. They feel a little soft in the midsection to me. They don't feel like they're hitting quite like they were hitting pre-WrestleMania. This obviously here is designed to get the tag team titles onto DIY in the next 60 days. However we get there, that's where we're getting there. And hopefully that marks the beginning of, of tag team wrestling on SmackDown. Because right now, Theory and Waller 
They've never felt fully cohesive like we thought they should, which is why, obviously, this is leading to a breakup. We saw kind of the, the first seeds laid here. That's the right thing to do. That's the right. Theory and Waller working against each other is going to be much more enjoyable than, than uh, them as a tag team. But the more important thing here is that, that I don't think people are seeing coming down the pipeline. This is going to lead, I believe, to an Austin Theory babyface turn. I think we are in the midst of Theory's not a great heel if you don't let him go all out with the cell phone and be the egotistical asshole, but but he's got all of the elements to be a great babyface. If they can make the turn, they can use Waller to make the turn. I, I think going forward, Theory will be a fun babyface to watch. We got Andrade and Angel cutting a promo in the back. This is one of those things where I don't want to question Triple H, but I question Triple H. I don't love the idea of Legato Del Fantasma reaching out to uh, Andrade after everything, the events of WrestleMania. This is one of those that play with the intelligence where you can't just write it off as Santos is willing to forgive. That doesn't feel like a Santos character trait. Now, if this is leading to kind of a bait and switch where they bring Andrade in, they they gain his trust, and then they kind of get revenge. I like it. But this is another one of these stories here. SmackDown has so much potential, and, and it's starting to feel like we're getting a little bit of just, well, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. And I know Triple H is willing to kind of step out on the ledge, but I to me it always feels like, why does nobody know how to book Andrade? And is that an Andrade thing or is that a wrestling promotion thing? Because his first run in WWE, I don't feel like he was booked well. When he went to AEW, I don't feel like he was booked that well. And then he comes back to WWE and it immediately feels like they don't know what to do with him. I asked the question, is it because, you know, is it the language barrier for Andrade? Is it just his inability to talk? Does that hurt him? I don't know what it is because it seems like, you know, he's got the right look, he, you know, He's got the, he, everything. He, he can wrestle in the ring. Wait, why can't we get a manager worth a shit to talk for Andrade and, and give him the push he deserves? The only other question I have for Triple H, the only other question is, is are, are the Mexican guys just allowed to fight Mexican guys? Because it feels like this like Mexican versus Mexican has been going on for the last two years. It's, it's transitioned from LWO to now Santos going after Andrade. And I get like styles mesh and things like that, but it's, eventually I need more purpose for like Legato de Fantasma and Andrade. We're going to have to start booking them into some situations that make sense to me. Kevin Owens and Paul Heyman hit the ring. Uh, pretty passionate promo, pretty fun to watch. Anytime Paul Heyman gets in there and starts just kind of riffing, you know it's going to be a good night. KO is the guy who can play off of that. It, it led into Street Profits versus uh, Tamatanga Bloodline tag team match. All right, cool. Like more, got to keep the Bloodline story going until Roman comes back. But here's the thing. I left this segment with three questions. And this is three questions I'm going to pose to you guys. You can help me out with. Three questions. Number one, is Kevin Owens lost in the shuffle again? It, I don't, what is Kevin Owens' purpose? What, what are we going to do with Kevin Owens when, when this bloodline, it feels like, once again, Kevin is a pawn in somebody else's story. And, and he's been a pawn in the bloodline story for far too long for it not to pay off at some point. Number two, how is Roman Reigns going to coexist with baby faces like Kevin Owens when he returns and ultimately is a baby face? How does he wrong everything he did for four years? That's compelling. I could get behind it. It will be fun, but, but it's a question that I have to ask. And then third, and this is the biggest question I have coming out of this, is is WWE and Triple H ever going to pull the trigger on Montez Ford? Like, Montez is that guy. It's obvious. And he is just buried under layers and layers of tag team bullshit. Like, with Bobby Lashley getting hurt, this was the ultimate opportunity to have Montez Ford step up and lead the group. Have him lead the pride. Show him as a front runner. And it just feels like maybe WWE has just come to grip with the fact that we're going to leave him in a tag team forever. He's got main event potential written 
all over him. And we're just not going to pull that trigger. Like at some point, and this is no knock on Angelo Dawkins because I think he will be fine, but at some point, we're going to have to split them up and see if they can both swim. And, and I think this, this is the prime time with Bobby going down, the pride seemingly having nothing to do other than aid Kevin Owens, start letting Montez cook. Start letting Montez lead the group. Start letting Montez be the face of, of the pride. Uh, then we got our main event wrestling match, which was Naomi and Bailey versus Piper and Chelsea, which stemmed from the interaction at the beginning of the show. Like I said, unless you just want to watch two hours of wrestling, this is the part that you could skip. This is the part you could fast forward. It's not anything against Bailey, not anything against Nia, not anything against Piper and Chelsea, but this is filler. This is, this is cake filling. This is, we've got to get to SummerSlam. We've got to get to Nia, or yeah, Nia versus Bailey. But right now, there's a couple premium live events in between that we're gonna we're gonna feed you some stuff that doesn't really matter. We're going to Scotland, so let's put the Scottish girl in there. No, nothing against Piper Niven; she deserves it. But it's just all kind of like this is kind of cookie cutter. This is basic. This is wrestling 101 storytelling. We've got a destination we've got to get to, but we've got more time than we need. Let's fill it. Let's fill it with a couple other things. So admittedly, I didn't, you know, I watched the match. It's good. Like I said, when Chelsea's in the ring, it's fun. The the heels picked up the victory, which is expected because the baby face is going to get the payoff at the, at the PLE. So it is what it is. It, it's more fun. Uh, the only thing I'll say about this is like with no, you know, there was no Tiffany Stratton, no Bianca, no Jade on SmackDown this week. And that's what's there. I think that's why I'm a little salty. Uh, quick note, in between Bailey and, and the tag team match and, and the final segment of, of SmackDown, there was a Meechin sighting. Not going to say that it's the greatest you know promo in the world. I'm a married man, so I can't say too much. But if you missed it, go watch it. Just go watch it. You'll understand why. You'll thank me later. I promise. Okay? On to, on to the main event here. AJ Styles. All night teased that he was going to retire. Show started. He was in uh, Nick Aldis' office saying that, you know, he's dressed in a nice suit saying, I've got some things I want to go out and say. Can I go say them? Nick Aldis was kind of like, why don't you say it now? Uh, AJ Styles played it real cool. I don't want to say it twice. So the lead up of the whole episode of SmackDown was building towards this ultimate AJ Styles retirement speech. He ultimately came out. He ultimately cut a what I felt like was a fairly believable promo. I thought he did a very good job of of bringing the OC out with him and talking and doing the the little hand thing, and he built it up. I think the crowd was starting to buy into the fact that this was it. Like I think we all were starting to go, okay, maybe AJ's done. Brings out Cody Rose. They shake hands. AJ Styles uh, proceeds to beat the shit out of Cody Rhodes, and we end SmackDown with AJ doing the, I think it's called the Styles Clash, off of the steel steps and standing over top of Cody Rhodes. I'm okay with this. I'm okay, I'm okay with going back to AJ versus Cody. I think we all knew that wasn't over. I think the Logan Paul thing was obviously a Saudi thing. Saudi wanted Logan Paul. It made sense. It worked. It got the numbers that they wanted it to get. Now we can get back to regularly scheduled programming. But even so, once again, I think that AJ Styles is just a pawn in the Cody Rhodes story. And it's hard for me to gain a ton of interest when I there's no belief to me. There, there's no world to me where AJ Styles becomes WWE champion. I just, I don't think it happens. So this, the exciting thing for me with AJ Styles is the partnership with TNA and the ability for him to go back to TNA. And this is where I think it gets interesting. I think with the, the retirement angle being played that, that AJ Styles is tired and kind of worn out, I think that Cody beats him in the next premium live event. And what we get is AJ disappearing and showing up on TNA almost like he left WWE. It, it'll be like in soccer when you when you borrow a player from another team. I think TNA, the return for Jordan Grace is going to be AJ Styles, and I think we'll get to see AJ Styles and TNA, and I think that's actually uh, that's pretty exciting. I, I honestly think that's pretty exciting. 
But uh, that is all I have for you guys today. Let me know your thoughts on today's episode. Uh, While you're at it, make sure to join the Casual Wrestling Club. Make sure to join the Casual Wrestling Discord. Uh, Make sure to like and share this video. Thank you guys, as always, for hanging out. I am Nerdy D. You guys are the Casual Wrestling Faction. And we will talk more wrestling tomorrow.